Ah oh, yes, the movies. Going to the theaters is always such a great experience. There's nothing else like it. You got the decor, the lights, the adverts, the concessions. Can't go to a theater and not get a cherry icy and sour patch watermelon. Oh, and then there's, you know, seeing the actual movie. One aspect of the movie-going experience that people often take for granted is the spectacle of it. Yes, you can always watch a movie at home, but you don't go to the theaters just to watch a movie. You go for the atmosphere, to hang out with friends, for the concessions, and so much more. Something vital that contributes to this unique atmosphere is the amount of promotional material made for the release of new films. Whether it be standard merchandise, display items, movie memorabilia and promotion is an art form in of itself. For example, there's of course my favorite form of movie promotion, marketing stunts. Take this one village in Spain that sacrificed itself for the 2011 Smurfs movie. In honor of the movie, they painted the whole town blue. This was done as the village was picked as the location for the world premiere of the film. So naturally, these historical buildings were all given a lovely Smurf hue. Honestly, this isn't even that crazy in the grand scheme of marketing. So today, let's go back through time and take a look at some of the best movie promotions out there. We're talking movie theaters, movie memorabilia, guerrilla marketing stunts gone wrong, and more. Let's begin. One of the most memorable parts of going to a theater is seeing all of the in-theater items made by marketing teams for their movies. Posters, standees, sometimes even statues, all made to be displayed leading up to and during a film's release. Many theaters have these displayed all over the place. They're definite eye-catchers. These are produced for pretty much any movie that gets released in theaters. They made some lovely ones for, again, the live-action Smurfs movies. Check out this standee statue combo for Scoob, a movie that didn't even release in theaters. Stuff like that makes you wonder, what happens to these when a theater is no longer showing a film? Well, it depends on the item. For posters, they usually just throw them out. A lot of the time they get sun faded or ripped before they get taken down, so they aren't worth saving. But for the higher quality items like statues, some companies take them back and store them away in places like warehouses. For example, here are some shots of some Warner Brothers statues stored away. Shaggy has seen better days. I love these promotional statues, and not just ones made for movies. Ones for video games, theme parks, they're all great, especially when people discover old ones still being used in modern times. This giant Crash Bandicoot statue was made for E3 1996, but was later found at an arcade in Oregon. And after that arcade closed, it moved to a family fun center in Washington. You can see that after all those years and moves, he's not in the best shape, and no one actually knows where it is nowadays. That's what usually happens to these. Sure, they're wonderfully made large statues of iconic characters, but they're made for marketing. In the eyes of companies, once their product is out there, there isn't much need to keep these around. You'll find tons of images of these just destroyed. Though, if you have the skills, restoring them makes for a great project. But that's the unfortunate truth with a lot of this stuff, and why it's great whenever preservation is possible. After a movie leaves theaters, a majority of this gets thrown out. Think about how it'll be in a hundred years, when someone's digging through a junkyard and they find a Theodore statue. Unfortunately, the only way to get a lot of these statues would be to know someone involved with their production, though they are sometimes given away. Some do end up with collectors, but those that don't often meet a grim fate. Moving on from statues, there's of course the items that theaters give away with tickets of the film, such as the popular Pokemon cards released for the movies, and these Spider-Verse earbuds. There are also pieces of merchandise made to be sold exclusively at concession stands, but I'll talk more about those later. It's great to see when a movie production can go above and beyond simple marketing for a film, doing unique promotions that'll leave a lasting impact on the viewer, enriching their relationship with the film that much more. I'm not saying we all need to be TJ Miller parasailing for the Emoji Movie, but this stuff goes a long way with making your movie even more special. The lead-up to the Sonic the Hedgehog movie was one of the most fascinating movie hype experiences I've ever witnessed. From the initial announcement in, what, 2014, to the rumors, the leaks, and its release, it's something I'll never forget. When I actually saw the movie, it was honestly one of the best theater experiences I've ever had. Everyone in the theater was having a blast, laughing at it all. To the group of people who asked us to say a uh, meow on cue, you guys were great and I hope you're all doing well. You too, guy who screamed yes when Sonic called Robotnik Eggman. To promote the movie, a good amount of merchandise was made and released, some of which has become quite elusive. And despite being an American movie, a lot of the merchandise was made exclusive to other regions around the world. Over in Japan, there was a promotion where if you reserved a ticket for the film early, you got this baby Sonic keychain figure. Though the movie was delayed over there which complicated things, at least you got this guy. 
One of my personal favorite items made for the movie would be this golden ring frisbee. Not because of the item itself, it looks like nothing more than a toilet seat, the real gold is its packaging. That's clearly art of the original design, not the one from the first trailer, the one from even earlier in production, complete with blue hands. This render, which appears to be a scrapped teaser image for the film, was also used on some other items too. I suppose since these were smaller promotional items, they didn't care to change the artwork used on them. As for more conventional items, we have this set of plushes. These were made by a company named PCO Group, and what makes them stand out is that they were only available to be purchased at actual movie theaters. So while you were grabbing your Cherry Icy, you could also get one of these. As such, they were never released in retail stores, and to make them even more elusive, were only released in Germany and Russia. I have this set that came from Germany. They're pretty nice. They have a few design quirks, but overall, pretty good for… theater plushes, I guess. Much like the toilet seat, the design used for these plushes looks pretty close to the original look of Movie Sonic, at least in terms of their eyes and shoes. But the final plushes look much better than their original prototypes. Which, uh, yeah, at least these guys have shoelaces. PCO also released these bottle caps, featuring lovely figurines of Movie Sonic. And of course, here are the prototypes. These pieces are lucky they were able to get redesigned before release. Sonic's redesign was done fairly late into production, so many companies had already spent a lot of resources creating stuff based off of the original design. Jack Pacific, for example, had to release their Baby Sonic plush as is, along with this figure that was part of a playset. That Baby Sonic keychain also fell victim to this, as he's barefoot, something that shouldn't even have been considered for any Sonic product at all, and yet there it is. Then there's the Build-A-Bear, which was also clearly not the finalized Sonic, given his almost blue eyes and <gasps> laces. In Mexico, there was this little head plush, as well as this popcorn bucket which was also available in Thailand. And there's a completely different popcorn bucket from Taiwan. Then of course the Germany and Russian stuff, and even more than that. It's nice the Sonic movie had plenty of merchandise released for it, even if some are incredibly hard to find and keep track of. This is sort of related. The way Sonic's design leaked was from a style guide made for merchandise that was revealed early. It seems most of the merchandise made for this movie was made based off of this. This means that after it was decided to redesign Sonic, it wasn't just the movie that needed to be redone, so did all of the physical items. I remember when this stuff leaked so clearly, it's super weird to look at now. I wonder if this art will ever be released in full resolution. Probably not. Sega and Paramount are most likely keeping this as locked up as they can. This version of the style guide went almost completely unused, besides this one Halloween costume. Even Sonic's final design was leaked, as an image of this standee was posted online before the second trailer. It's clearly not uncommon for aspects of movies to be leaked through these pieces of merchandise. The third Spongebob movie, Sponge on the Run, has had quite the troubled history. It was originally scheduled to be released in 2019. That would have been great, as that year was Spongebob's 20th anniversary. But after several rewrites and a new name, Sponge on the Run was set for a May 2020 release. However, due to circumstances outside of Paramount's control, the film saw many more delays and ultimately released far outside its original window. This created an interesting scenario, one where the film was delayed only a few months before it was set to come out. So the film was pushed back after products made for it were already in stores. Promotional items and tie-ins for films generally start showing up well before they come out in theaters, and that's what happened here. This actually isn't too uncommon. The same thing happened with Minions The Rise of Gru, and it's been an issue in the past as well. For example, it happened with classics like Food Fight and Hoodwink 2. With Food Fight, there were products made for the original version of the film, the one that was planned to be released in 2003. But when a majority of the film's assets were apparently stolen, much of the film needed to be remade, resulting in the 2012 disaster we know today. But a few relics from the original version still exist. Hoodwink 2, Hood vs. Evil, was originally slated to come out in early 2010, but due to internal disputes it was pushed back to April 2011. Despite this, Burger King released toys for the film in January of 2010, an entire year before the movie would come out. Going back to Spongebob, in early 2020, theaters began receiving posters and complex standees for the movie, all displaying the May 2020 release date. Food products began showing up with Sponge on the Run branding too, some even having offers to win a free movie ticket. All of these would become outdated and or invalidated by the film's delays. Your Pop-Tarts likely won't get you that ticket, unfortunately. One company that's been hit really hard by these delays is PCO Group, the same company that produced those Sonic items. On their website, under the Movie Promos category, you'll see tons of products they designed for films like Trolls World Tour, Scoob, Minions The Rise of Gru, Peter Rabbit 2, man these guys were hit hard by 2020, and Sponge on the Run. 
Well, the site still calls it by its original name, It's a Wonderful Sponge, but the point here is this company produced many in-person theater-exclusive items for a bunch of movies that never even made it to worldwide theaters. Merchandise is a huge deal for these films, so having merch in the actual theaters is a genius idea, until those films switch to video on demand and you have no place to release your products. It's likely most of these 2020 items will go unreleased, or at least not as originally planned. For those who wanted to buy the Blow Mold Scoob in theaters, I've got bad news. The company made a whole range for Sponge on the Run, including cups, cup toppers, popcorn bins, and even a set of plushes. Included in the set are the Camp Coral designs of Spongebob, Patrick, Gary, and Plankton. These were actually revealed before the younger designs of Patrick or Plankton were shown off, making these their first public appearance. Despite having such an ambitious line planned, it seemed all of this would go the way of their Trolls and Scoob line. No theater release meant no way to release these items, right? Well, and this actually isn't that well known, but the movie did actually come out in theaters in Canada on August 14th, 2020, far before anywhere else in the world. I'm not sure why they did this, because the entire movie is now leaked online. I definitely haven't watched any of those camera recordings yet, absolutely not. But yeah, technically, the film saw a theater release in 2020, and while its box office returns may look subpar, it meant there was a way those theater exclusive items could be released, and they did. Today I'll focus on the plushes, as I was able to get a few from an eBay seller who imported them, I assume from Canada. I got the Spongebob, Patrick, as well as a larger Spongebob. Look, he has his hat. This one is interesting as it wasn't shown on PCO's listing for the set. Maybe he was added later, the site isn't the most up to date. Looking at their tags reveals something interesting. These are unmistakably the same patterns as what was shown on PCO's website, but the tags make no mention of them at all. Instead reading, manufactured by Snapco LLC. Looking them up, they're a company jointly owned by Snap Creative and PCO Group, explaining how these guys distributed the plushes. It seems like these items are designed by Snap Creative, and then they're distributed by either PCO or Snapco. It's just legal regional stuff, they're the same plushes. PCO deals in Europe, while Snapco is based in the United States. These are really great plushes, especially for theater exclusives. They're about the same quality as those Sonics, which were also very good despite their odd designs. It's a shame these won't see a wide release. Given the movie's limited release in theaters, I can't imagine too many sets of these are going to be produced. If you're into Spongebob stuff, definitely grab them if you can, because they're likely going to become seriously hard to find collector's items in the future. Gotta get that plankton someday. The same goes for any of these theater exclusive items, as well as the posters and standees that reflect the original release plans for the film. It's kinda sad looking at this stuff now. Oh, if only. Released on April 22nd, 2001, you can't ignore the absolute world-rippling blast the original Shrek had on society. The film was a huge success, and it should be respected. Was it because of how it geniusly mocked the fairy tale genre? Because of the story? Nah. Shrek should be remembered for being the direct cause of the Shrek 2 toaster strudels. Shrek is a franchise with some of the most far-reaching promotional products out there, and to me it sticks out because, look, I love Shrek, but wow. You'd be surprised how many Shrek items exist. There are the Shrek printed waffles, this Shrek Build-A-Bear, these ogre green slime Twinkies, and of course the Shrek Pez Dispenser. Those who wish to immerse themselves in the Shrek life are in luck, as each movie brought with it tons of products. It's funny seeing all these modern products with Shrek on them, given the movie's setting. Not that Shrek is a franchise with any integrity, but a lot of these don't really go well with the series. Sure, we have the gross-out Shrek Cheetos that turned your tongue green, but Shrek NASCAR? Hmm. What I'm saying is I don't think they were imagining Shrek's Super Slam while designing the first movie. Seeing what Shrek became through marketing makes looking at the products for the first movie very interesting. Take a look at these action figures by McFarlane Toys. They have detailed sculpts, grungy packaging, definitely no Pez dispenser. And then of course there's the T-rated Xbox game. Looking back at the early concepts for Shrek, it's nuts that this led to what it is now. I know what you're thinking. I've known it since you tuned in. You're thinking, I can't freestyle rap. Well, I've had it up to here with people assuming that ogres can't break it down. Somebody lay down a beat. Fee, fee, fi, fi, fo, fo, fun, Shrek. Movies are incredibly marketable by nature, but you have to be careful. A lot of promotions have the potential to break the world the movies are set in, or ruin the messages they're trying to say. The obvious example is this car commercial starring the Lorax. Being from Illumination, it's not surprising. As for Shrek, once it was discovered that, hey, I bet in 20 years we can still sell toys of this guy, lots of the franchise's edge vanished. 
it being as franchised as it is, has morphed the original ideas of the series. For business, it was a great decision, but I doubt the original designers of, well, Shrek, knew the character would become such a marketing legend. Oh, hello there! Shrek here, and I'm ticked off at people who think that just because I'm an ogre, I can't dance! Now how about the donkey? Other Shrekified wonders include this Funko Pop, Shrek's Rotten Root Canal Play-Doh playset. My favorite personal encounter I've ever had with a Shrek item has to be this one time I was at the carnival. I absolutely whiffed it at that game where you have to throw the balls into the trash cans, but instead of just letting me walk away as the loser I was, the Game Master gave me a tiny Shrek plush, which honestly was probably much more offensive than just giving me nothing. Let's see, there's a Shrek 2 DVD holder. Man, there's been a lot of stuff made for just theme parks. Does anyone out there have a complete collection of Universal Studios Singapore Shrek items? The public perception of Shrek has changed radically over the years. The movies are nothing more than a joke to a lot of people nowadays. I can't help but feel that was fueled by the oversaturation of the character. Will this Shrekage ever come to an end? Probably not. And that's okay. Knowing that DreamWorks is now owned by Universal and has close ties to Illumination, and that more Shrek films are planned, it's clear that Shrek will continue to plague our world for many moons to come. Sometimes, marketing for a film can go too far. I'm not talking about the unbelievably offensive Shrek toaster strudels, I'm talking about a time when what was meant to be a simple promotion for a movie sent a city into full-blown panic. One of the more creative ways to promote a product or business is with a viral marketing stunt. We see it all the time, but how often do these guerrilla marketing stunts create a nationwide scare? Aqua Teen Hunger Force is one of the earliest and most iconic shows on Adult Swim, and in 2007, it was getting a movie, Aqua Teen Hunger Force colon movie film for theaters. To drum up hype for movies, you generally see real-life advertisements placed around popular areas. Billboards, decals on buses, all the crazy stuff you see in New York City, stuff like that. When it comes to viral marketing strategies though, some get pretty crazy. Back in 2012, the movie Chronicle was promoted with this flying people stunt. Many citizens from New York and New Jersey reported seeing people soaring through the sky, and the whole thing went viral online. When it was revealed to be a hoax made for the movie, it got the film tons of attention. So with a series as out there as Aqua Teen, it was only natural for the movie to get a crazy marketing stunt. The company Interference Incorporated was hired by Turner Broadcasting to handle the marketing for the film. What'd they come up with? Well, the company would produce and hang up magnetic light devices in many cities in America, displaying an LED image of the Moonanites, popular characters from the show. Two variants were produced for the two main Moonanites, both giving the middle finger. The devices themselves were about one feet tall, featured an LED screen, and were held up magnetically. They also showed batteries and unobscured wires. This'll surely catch their attention! It's very likely this design is what caused the stunt to go so wrong, given how strange it would look to someone unfamiliar with the series. Though, a bizarre design is the type of thing that gets people talking, so this was probably intentional. The company produced the devices, and two artists were hired to place them around locations. Planning began in November of 2006, when a Boston visual artist who goes by Zebler met with a man named John, who worked for Interference Inc. After agreeing to the project, he got his friend on board as well. Also, the two were to be paid just $300 each for their work. They received 40 devices, 20 of the lights were hung up in the middle of January, and the rest on the 29th. The devices were spread across America. Boston wasn't the only part of the US where they were located. Being a marketing stunt, they were set up nationwide, but it seems Boston were the ones that noticed. On January 31st, 2007, at 8.05 a.m., one of the devices was spotted by a passenger in Boston, who then promptly contacted the police. Shortly after, the Boston Police Department and Fire Department came to the scene, and they concluded the device could potentially be a bomb. Wait, what? So they destroyed it. The city of Boston was put on lockdown, with fears that the devices were part of a already-in-motion terrorist attack. Between 2 and 3 p.m. that same day, a police analyst identified the character and realized this was a publicity stunt. Promptly, Turner Broadcasting issued an apology. After determining what they were and where they came from, Ziebler and his friend were arrested and were interviewed by the press, but their attorney told them not to discuss the incident outside of court, leading to them discussing haircuts. I think my dreadlocks are pretty nice and they're gonna keep growing for a little while. Uh, and I, maybe they'll reach my knees or something. I don't, I don't know. What I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting sort of more due to um to get a haircut because getting my bangs now. They sparked fears of terrorism. The marketing executives promoting Aqua Teen Hunger Force on Cartoon Network. Now the city of Boston wants them to pay. Are you afraid that if uh, you go to prison, you'll get your haircut? Um.
While very funny, this only enraged the worrying city even more, and things did not look good on Cartoon Network's part. Following their arrest, protesters began showing support for the two, believing it was unnecessary. They eventually apologized in court and their charges were dropped, only having to serve 60 hours of community service at the Boston Community Center. The scare really only lasted from around 8am to 3pm that day. After it was made clear it was just a marketing stunt for a cartoon movie gone wrong, everyone mostly moved on. Well, the general public did at least. This controversy really shook Turner Broadcasting, and it changed Cartoon Network and Adult Swim forever. Within a week of the scare, Turner and Interference Inc. agreed to pay $2 million in compensation to avoid being sued. The then president of Cartoon Network, Jim Samples, also resigned. It definitely had an impact, but looking back, this was all pretty insane. Gregory Bergman, author of the 2008 book BizWords, compared the devices to homemade light brights, stating that this occurred in Boston, home of Harvard, MIT, and other schools of learning, is embarrassing. Many believe that Boston officials completely overreacted and the whole thing was overblown. Of course, hindsight is 2020. It's worth noting that it took weeks for police to be notified of these. Had that one passenger not made that call, this entire incident might not have happened, or at least would have went very differently. Funnily enough, in 2013, Zebler was hired by the city of Boston to create a light show for their New Year's celebration. He was paid $50,000 for his work. The mayor at the time stated that Boston was, quote, a forgiving city. This, however, isn't the end of the story. After the incident, the show's staff wished to satirize the event in an actual episode of the show. Set to be the opener of the show's fifth season in 2008 was an episode simply titled Boston. This episode was to be a parody of the event, making fun of how ridiculous it was, especially to the show's team. The episode got far long enough to already have animation done for it, but its production was halted by higher-ups, worrying its release could stir up more unwanted controversy. And so for years, episode 69 of Aqua Teen Hunger Force remained lost, and was never released. Brief details of the episode were released over the years. It was apparently one of the co-creators' favorite episodes. It was even said there were multiple versions of the episode in existence, but it was decided the episode would go unaired as long as the event was even a memory. Despite the wishes of those involved, the episode was eventually leaked online on January 8th, 2015. Watching the episode, it's a great parody, but I see why the network who already paid $2 million wouldn't want it aired. It had been said in the past that if the episode was ever leaked, the series would be cancelled. As it turns out, the final season of the show aired in 2015. Coincidence? Actually, yeah. If you do want to watch the episode, it's pretty easy to find online nowadays. Though keep in mind, it's unfinished. So yeah, that was all pretty heavy. Any fun Aqua Teen topics we can discuss? Uh, oh, here we go. The movie was released in theaters on April 13th, 2007, but as another considerably less destructive form of marketing, Adult Swim claimed they'd be airing the movie in full on TV on April 1st. Adult Swim is known for their great April Fool's pranks, and this was one of the more ingenious ones. They played about the first minute of the movie, enough to make you think they're actually going through with it, only to then shrink the screen to the bottom corner, while regular programming continued. In the end, the movie made $5.5 at the box office, pulling in significant profits considering its budget. Was it worth putting all of Boston on lockdown? Well, that depends who you ask. This certainly was a way to get everyone to know about your film. But it's a great example of how foresight is really important when it comes to marketing. There might be no such thing as bad publicity, but you should probably aim to not have an entire city go on lockdown over your marketing stunt. So now it's the part of the video where I talk about theater arcades. Most theaters I've been to have this tiny arcade section. It's just another way for theaters to earn a little extra money, but boy do I have memories with these. We've all been there. Your parents want to go see the Ant Bully, but you want to win the DS out of Keymaster. I love looking at these machines because since they're so rigged, they often have super old prizes in them. Movie theaters and these machines really go hand in hand. For example, you can fill your claw machines up with plushes based off of movies currently playing in the theater. You never know what you're going to find when you see a claw machine. Sometimes you see a generic fish, other times you see Turtwig. Around 2009, right when Dragon Ball Evolution was making the rounds, some theaters started having these Dragon Ball Z branded claw machines, which contained Japanese imported Banpresto figures. I don't remember ever seeing one of these in person, but when I was young, I remember I saw a stacker machine at one of my theaters. To my surprise, in the minor prizes range, they had Kirby right back at you Japanese keychains. I believe these ones. Unfortunately, since I was so young, I couldn't make it to the minor prize, and I never saw them again after that. That stacker experience is only rivaled by one other time. I was at this really grimy arcade connected to a go-karting track, and they had a stacker machine. The only major prize that was still standing in there? A sun-faded DVD copy of Robots. 
Besides those machines, you usually also find stuff like 25 cent dispensers, one of the many racing games. They're so basic and yet they're always so cozy. There's no arcade quite like a movie theater arcade. For how much of a juggernaut The Simpsons is, in terms of recognizability and merchandise, it's surprising there wasn't a theatrical movie until 2007. But when the time came, they went all out. The idea of taking a location from a piece of media and bringing it into the real world is always fun. Theme parks have made a killing off of the concept. At Universal Studios Florida, there's an entire fully realized Springfield area complete with rides, walk-around characters, iconic locations, and tons of references. However, this wasn't the first time a piece of Springfield was brought to life. In July of 2007, to promote the Simpsons movie, several 7-Eleven locations across North America were converted into Quickie Marts. There were 11 in the United States and one in Canada. These 12 locations were completely transformed on July 1st of that year, with signs, props, and tons of merchandise. 7-Eleven locations everywhere, even those outside of the 12, began selling exclusive Simpsons products. You could buy Buzz Cola, Krusty O's, Squishies, and of course, the iconic Sprinklicious Donut. It was like the world of The Simpsons was brought to life, and people loved it. It was decided that Duff beer would not be sold at the locations, due to the film only being rated PG-13. A Duff energy drink was available instead. There was even a contest. Customers who bought specific items, such as the Squishies, which, by the way, are a parody of 7-Eleven Slurpees making this a perfect collaboration, would receive a code that could be entered online. The grand prize was to be animated into an episode of the show. That is so cool, I love stuff like that. I remember there was a similar contest for Puka, and I never knew who won. So many fun display items were created as well. You can tell they had fun with this. I'm not even that much of a Simpsons fan, but I remember seeing those donuts so vividly, and they looked so good. Goes to show how good of a promo this was. The promotion was a huge success, as the converted locations reported around 30% increased profits. Many stores sold out of the exclusive merchandise in just a few days. But despite the success, the promotion didn't last long, and those locations were turned back to normal by mid-August. Nowadays, all that remains are the promotional and display items. Who wouldn't buy this? The release of The Simpsons movie really was something special. It was one of the most marketed movies of all time when it came out, and there was so much more made for it beyond this, but nothing was as ambitious or memorable as bringing the Quickie Mart to life. And there you have it, a look at some of the craziest movie promotions and pieces of merchandise from over the years. It's always fun to see what exciting things companies come up with to promote their films, even if most of the time, this stuff ends up forgotten. The film is obviously what you should focus on, but a movie's extended universe of offshoots can be just as interesting. This video is a tribute to all of the great work that goes into this stuff, most of which goes unnoticed, yet is integral to the industry. So much talent goes into this stuff, even though they're really time-sensitive. Though, they serve their job well, and they're like a snapshot in time. A reminder of how the world was back when Rock Dog hadn't been released. Next time you go to the theaters and see a display advertising the next hit film, remember that someone had to make that. All of this, even this Minions display, is a form of art. And if you're a huge fan of some of these movies, this stuff makes for great collection pieces if you're able to get a hold of them. When it comes to posters and maybe standees, some theaters let you just reserve them. You could ask someone working there if it would be possible for you to grab them when they're done using them. Hey, it's better than them being thrown out. And that's probably what makes these items and these promotions as a whole so interesting. So many of these items are completely gone now, only surviving in pictures. And tie-ins like the Quickie Mart only last for a short amount of time, despite the impact they might have on fans. There's something great about preserving these. It's like being able to save a piece of time. It's like people who still have blockbuster cases, or we shop channel gift cards. A movie's generally only in theaters once, but these are memories we'll never forget. 